Let's do it. All right, good morning, everyone. This is uh, JJ Arisha with Pismo Ventures, and today we have with us Jeff Koenig. Jeff is going to present on uh, financial strategy, uh, so strategic financial planning to be more specific as the title. Um, I'll give him the floor in a couple of minutes. Um, just wanted to update everyone on the uh, competition. Um, we Round one is done and we uh, announced the winners um, to the two that we, we announced it to the winners yesterday. All the winners uh, know that they moved from round one to round two. We will be sending uh, an email to everyone today announcing uh, the winners to the rest. Um, also, we will be putting it on social media. So um, out of uh, 197 companies that applied, uh, 87 emerged to round two. We had to close two categories because we did not ha have enough applicants or we did not have applicants, which, which is social enterprise and um, a, category, a catch all category, we called it other. Um, anyway, so uh, everyone here should be receiving an email uh, with some uh, with the with the winners. Some of the winners that we have on the list, um, we just have initials, and uh, you will know why later on um, because we cannot reveal their names yet, but we will reveal them to the public uh, down the road. Um, uh, everybody's been uh, really. Uh, praising the webinars that we have. Uh, this is really part of what we're trying to do is educate entrepreneurs. And uh, today's um, webinar is really uh, a, a big part of any startup, which is a financial strategy. Um, after this event, just like we've been doing uh, since the beginning, uh, we have uh, a social networking or a virtual networking time uh, on, uh, on a platform called HIO. Uh, we have posted the uh, link and uh, the password. You need both the link and the password in the chat in order for you to join. So please uh, uh, grab them or copy them and keep them on the side because when we end uh, the webinar, the chat will disappear. Um, one quick uh, reminder uh, for next week. Next week on the 15th, um, we have scheduled a sales webinar. Um, basically a sales webinar for startup <clears throat> and um, the uh, the person that is uh, presenting it uh, had a had a conflict that came up he needed to travel and he can't be he can't make it so we moved it till the, the 6th of November so we moved the sales uh, webinar from uh, October 15th to November 6th Friday November 6th still from 9 to 11 just like uh, all the all the webinars that we've been doing so uh, stay tuned please uh, if you've already added it to your calendar please move it around or go to our website um, and you'll be able to change it as well um, all right or you should have received probably a zoom um, uh, notification as well all right that's all i have uh, i'm going to give the floor to jeff jeff please uh, give us a quick intro but who Jeff Koenig is, and the floor is yours. Well, I'll keep that very brief. Um, uh, my name is Jeff Koenig. I'm a member of multiple angel groups. Uh, I've been a small business person uh, my whole career. I love to um, uh, start them and run them and sell them, and, uh, and ultimately, uh, now I'm too tired for that. So uh, I do a lot of consulting, and I do some advocacy work for small business in Washington, D.C., but uh, let's go. Um, I don't use slides to write papers, okay? I use them to tell stories that provoke. Uh, so a downloaded copy of this slideshow isn't gonna do you any good, but I will offer an outline of major points if you want it, and this is going to be fast paced and visual. So if you multitask, you're going to miss a lot. Um, if you have no uh, uh, grounding or foundation in finance, this might feel like you're drinking through a fire hose, uh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Just absorb um, the thought lines that I'm taking you through and uh, the outline later uh, can be your notes. Okay. So look, the whole point of a business is to make money, right? And if you're not uh, Alex Keaton from the 1980s who would sacrifice anything to make a buck, then you're normal. Now, sure, let's make lots of money and let's be comfortable with wealth. 
but it'd be sweet just to provide for family needs, wouldn't it? If you're well adjusted, you also want to do this fair and square. Nobody wants to be the news fodder for the next fraud scandal. So you're all in the fast growth startup space, right? I mean, you're not starting a local restaurant or a local mom and pop, which is gambling enough as it is. You're putting your quarters into the venture capital world's coin pusher game. And sure, you know a lot of other people who lost their quarters playing this game, but you're convinced you know right when and where to put your quarter to push the plunder in your lap, am I right? Well, it better be, because if you're not personally convinced you have the gumption to win, no matter what, you're putting your quarters in an empty machine. I get accused of being a CFO, and I didn't go to school for it. My undergrad is in music. But I will credit music for fusing creative and analytical thinking, both of which is needed in order to deeply understand economics. And those are currencies, by the way. Clever, huh? It's an uh, inside musician's joke. I didn't need an MBA degree to appreciate that humans make trillions of financial decisions every day. And every decision pulls at every other one like gravity on matter. Economic forces in total are beyond everybody's control. Nobody, not even POTUS, controls this massive spread out force. But once you recognize repeated financial patterns and anticipate the decisions that customers are likely to make with money, you'll have the ability to direct the forces coming at you and manipulate them just enough to produce a pre-envisioned planned outcome. So here's your first takeaway. Just absorb this. Managing all your business risks from startup to exit is an exercise in strategy. And the dollar is the universal quantification of business strategy. Strategies are merely abstract comments if you don't quantify them. Now, I said my skill set is finance because that's the shirt we put on dollar fortune tellers. But just to be clear, accounting and finance are two different disciplines, though they use some of the same data. I like accusing accountants of ratting you out to others, like Uncle Sam or your bankers or investors. Accountant say, shares the same root word as accountability. Who do you have obligations to? Now, finance uses this data set to help us make strategic decisions, leading to outcomes that haven't happened yet. By the way, if you haven't seen Tenet, I just saw it a couple of weekends ago, and I recommend it. It's a good time travel mind bender. So where the accountant plans your defense based on what has already happened, Finance plans your offense to create a desired future. Finance doesn't just calculate, it generates intelligence, not unlike military intelligence. Antip anticipating an adversary's moves and moving the resources into place to overcome a threat and win. So let's figure out what kind of executive you are. Consider this list of seven company needs and just Take whatever is in front of you, a sticky note and a pen or something, and, and put them in order, in the order you think that most companies usually hire these functions. Or if your experience so far doesn't give you that much insight to answer that, just put these functions in the order in which you would like to do them all yourself. And just use the numbers. You don't have to write them out. So I'll give you 45 seconds. Go.
Okay, you got it in order? This is just for you. So here are the typical acronyms for those executive functions. So if you take a look at your numbered list, what order did you put them in? What order do you think you would hire them? Now, number seven is normally first. Uh, Adrian offered uh, answers uh, in the chat, and there it is. That's the first one. Most all founders are TOs. They're inventors. So if you're a typical entrepreneur, as soon as you started tossing an idea around in your head that you thought others might buy, you became the first COO, whether you gave yourself that title or not. And while we're all mad sciencing in our own garages, our only real liability is to ourselves. If the experiment blows up, hopefully it's only our pride that gets hurt. But as soon as you want to leave the garage and sell your idea to someone else, no matter who, the accounting, legal, and executive functions are demanded. Either you try being as decisive as a swordsman without a round table and conquer the world by yourself, or you recruit more knights to help you. Fortunately, legal and accounting can be outsourced for a long time. Still, you address these functions early on because of the risks you incur by just leaving your garage. Now, when your MVP is ready and it's time to go to market, you're looking for employees and customers that you hope share your vision. Re recalling my usual roles, infectious popularity, how long do companies run before outsourcing or hiring their first real CFO? The moment you put a price on your product or ask a grantor or investor for money to keep operating, you were already making a CFO level strategic financial decision that had significant future impacts on your company. So how did you start making your decisions? Did you design a profitable business model and then create a product or service to fit it? Or did you do something that jazzed you and think there just has to be a model that guarantees your cool idea will pay you well? Look, nobody's in the A camp, okay? We're all in the B camp. How many of you decided that you could implement your idea without really needing to develop a wide and deep financial model? Can't we just figure this out as we go along? So let me pull the curtain back a bit. I really don't like spreadsheets. Math formulas are a chore. I hate calculus. I love this. The last thing I want to be doing when I'm hucking the NAR is calculating angle of descent, wind speed and direction, and the coefficient of injury on an endo. I just want to ride the darn bike and have a blast. And if I'm stressing the details, I'm not having fun. So whatever you like to do, including in your company, does this describe you at heart too? So the second takeaway is coming. If you're a casual rider, you might assume that race winners just have this 100% raw natural talent. Practice or race day, talent rich lives must be great. What you don't see and perhaps wouldn't think about is that racers spend 99% of their time planning and sweating the details so that when race time comes, it's just subconscious execution. But that's true for all the pro racers. So why do most still lose? Short of a freak accident or a bad decision deviating from your plan, someone else still had a better plan and better execution. Only three get the podium and stand in glory while the rest stand back and watch. Do you think winning any race in life is just being born with it? having an unlimited resource and just showing up? Well, it's not, including in business. Statistically, most of you are behaving like that's how it works though, because without a rigorous financial model, you're just doing this, flying by the seat of your pants. If you're gonna ride your business and your only goal is to get to the bottom without dying, that's fine for a hobby. Whenever it gets a little sketchy and you don't know how to handle that hairpin exposure, don't risk it. Break, pull off the trail, let others pass. Avoid the tough stuff. Sure, you can try another race, but you're just playing. The ones who are serious about winning are calculating, planning, and measuring every minute of sleep, every calorie, every training detail, not because they love the rigor, but they love the result, and they won't accept not winning. Fair and square, of course. 
In one real sense, businesses that fail were unable or refused to recognize the many threats and predetermine how to conquer the hazards with confidence. Most businesses start, most startups to even raise venture capital fail to achieve great exits. Why is that? Because the rigors of the planning and calculation were just beyond what the founders expected. And so they ran out of cash. There are countercultural business cheerleaders in respectable places, places I respect, like the Kauffman Foundation, Wharton Business School. You can find this in Entrepreneur Magazine and American Express, and many others willing to sell you an idea that you really, really want to believe. And that's why it works for them. That this business stuff, it's all just right place, right time, grit and attitude, hope and faith. Well, is that what got you through school too? Or quick promotions at your first career job? You didn't need to study or do the work to learn something you had never done before. You just needed to show up and make sure everybody liked you and breeze right on through. I hope not. Familiarity with a financial word does not mean you get it. I did not know any better myself when I started the first of a dozen businesses, which at times left me thorn ridden off the trail. Every time I felt frustrated. This country is the world's beacon of entrepreneurism. Why on earth did nobody prepare me adequately for actual profitability? So write an answer down for yourself. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. What's your answer to this question? If any part of your answer says you worked hard, never answer this question again in a way that implies you worked to earn profit. Profit is not earned. Salaries and wages are earned and are measured in work. You gave physical or mental effort to the business and it hopefully handed you a periodic paycheck. Until it does pay you a full and fair market wage for your work to help make happy customers, your business isn't profitable. So a paycheck must happen first. The third takeaway is understanding what teachers don't teach about profitability. Here's the definition I use. Consider the underlined words. Imagine the sentence without the underlined words. It still works. And if you walked up cold to somebody in business and asked them if it was true, they would probably say yes. But simply making an investment and taking a risk doesn't guarantee you a darn thing in return, does it? Don't you think that you need those three underlined words? Have you done enough of those things as of right now, today, to get to a positive exit? Risk and work don't overlap, but they can coexist. Effort might protect risk but one is not canceled by the other. I can take a lot of risk with little effort. You know, people go down steep hills up to 65 miles an hour with limited steering and braking capacity on these things. Just step on and ride. Longboarders are nuts. But is a VC funded startup any less crazy if you're just going to step on and go without knowing exactly how you're going to get to the bottom without smashing your face? I can also put a lot of effort into something without taking any risk, like riding a stationary bike. Most executives focus only on the PL statement. They should pay more attention to their balance sheets. Some of you came to the National Venture Plan competition with a presentation slide of sales projections. Some of you don't even have that, but I've been looking at them. Almost none of you have submitted a cash flow projection with a well-formed capital plan to raise enough money to get to profitability. How many of those watching today have projections that look like the proverbial hockey stick? Now, while founders take these projections very seriously, investors, without intending you any offense, often view these projections humorously. Now, how many of you can give me a number right now off the top of your head for how much investment capital you will need before turning a sustainable profit. When doing your sales projections, did you do what a lot of founders do and back into your projections by determining how much money you wanted to spend 
than calculating an ROI you thought would attract investors, allowing that to determine the sales you would need to get there. Customers don't care what your and your investors' needs are. They will only buy if what you offer is worth it to them. So what you should be doing is determining when and how much customers are going to buy from you for their own reasons. Use that to determine how little you can spend and still meet their expectations, and then calculate to see if that provides enough profit. I'm going to introduce you to the steps it takes to approach the four most loathed things in financial business planning. I'm going to help you to predict how much you're going to sell, budget for the marketing that you need, know your cost of labor, and raise the money you need to deliver an attractive investor ROI, which, who's the first investor? It's you. Why do we writhe in frustration at planning these things? Maybe we feel like frauds when we try to convince others our assumptions aren't wild guesses. The problem is we simply lack methods we can be confident in. Making forward-looking financial statements isn't the miracle of incredible luck at guessing. It's instead doing what our math teachers asked us to do in grade school. Do you remember? Show our work. The math is easy when we break a financial forecast into an equation made up of much smaller, simpler logical assumptions. I can't make you a CFO in an hour nor tell you what the recipe for your business should be. What I can do is give you the ingredients. Knowing what quantities to figure is what I'm going to introduce you to discovering. By the way, if you're interested in more extensive planning tools and lab time with me to help with your projections in business, there will be an opportunity to sign up for my H2D program, which I'll explain later. So let's get into the grandpappy of all business lies. Projecting revenue. <laughs> Doing it successfully is like planning to fly a jumbo jet to Hawaii through rainstorms at night prior to 1978. Now hit me in the chat box. Does anyone know what happened in 1978 that changed airline navigation? You got it right. GPS. The first GPS satellites. Before then, with an accurate compass and a correct heading to Honolulu, we could be sure to fly straight to our destination on the tiniest bit of land in a vast ocean. The problem was, how do we know when we had traveled a sufficient distance to drop underneath the cloud deck and look for the runway lights on that vast sea? So let's figure out who's in our cockpit today. This is an interactive period, so get ready to use your chat. Hit me if you've been a company CEO before. Just say yes. I'll count the yeses. All right, very good. I see six. So, six of you have operated the steering yoke before. Now, you experienced pilots, just you six, respond this time. Hit me again if every business you've ever led has always returned more money to every investor. All right, looks like I've got two yeses. So the rest of you, so two of you have only made money. You've never lost any. That's great. That means the rest of you um, have crashed. So four or five of you are still alive, or a couple of you are still alive, and four or five of you um, uh, ran out of fuel and there weren't any survivors. So we've got a couple experienced flights, uh, pilots still flying. And we've got four or five haunted planes. Okay, we're done with the four bars. Now hit me again in chat if this is your first time at the helm as a company CEO. Just give me a yes. Okay. 
All right, looks like I see five, five or six there. So five or six of you have been granted pilot's licenses, but you've never successfully landed a plane before. So that's an interesting flight to be on. We also don't know where you went to flight school or if you were self-taught surfing the web, reading about how to fly a plane, but whatever. We're done with the three bars. Now, hit me again, just give me a yes if you're the current non-CEO executive in your company. You're a current executive, but you're not the CEO. Any yeses? Okay, so our flights today have no flight attendants. This is gonna be an interesting flight. Now, how many are with me today that are none of the above? You're not here representing a company that you're running. Um, you're here for in other capacities or for other reasons. Any yeses? Well, these are COVID times. We have some pretty empty planes. So I see one and those are our passengers. So, Stephen, you're the guy. Looks like you decided to buy a ticket on a flight and, uh, you know, um, the forward-looking statements we see in the pitch decks you're receiving or your pre-flight safety briefings. Now, most briefings I see as an investor usually only tell me what can go right, not where to find the life vests. So as an investor, I have to be that guy in the cabin who raises his hand and asks a what if question. The answer is usually a variation of don't worry, we won't need an oxygen mask because your idea is too big to crash. Oh wait, I forgot. How many of you who are not the CEO and not are the CFO, do we have any CFOs today? Hit me with a yes. This means you're doing actual CFO things, not just accounting things. All right, so it doesn't look like we've got enough capable navigators for our flight today. Well, who says we can't have an adventure in the skies? All right, folks, today you're the crews and passengers we have and we're pulling away from the jet bridge. You're committed. You're gonna fly over some mountains and then a big ocean to find a little spot of land in the middle of it, rain or shine. Do you know precisely when you're going to see land and make a controlled descent? If you don't, the ocean feels like concrete when you try to land on it. So someone volunteer, and since we can't see each other, don't worry about how you look, just for the mental fun of it, offer a theory for how you would calculate knowing exactly how many minutes to fly on the proper heading in order to know when to descend in a rainstorm before 1978. So just use the chat, what are some things you're gonna measure to get to Hawaii safely? I'll give you some time. Who wants to try this? But this is a response I often get. There's kind of a brain freeze. It's like, gee, I don't know what to do. And this is what we do in finance a lot too. Now, of course, I had some time to really just kind of sit and think about this, but uh, here's some of the stuff I thought of. And I'll bet you there's dozens of things missing from this list. I'm not an experienced pilot. So the purpose of this exercise isn't to prove to ourselves what we already know that we aren't these two. But what I hope you take away from it is that most business startups do indeed launch as recklessly as me getting in a plane with someone promising to get me safely to Hawaii without doing the math. It's really abnormal for startups to not be this reckless. Part of the reason is people usually don't die as a result. And watching the startup finance episode of ridiculousness sounds like fun for people with enough time and money to waste. 
still we can and often do get financially or reputationally injured when we miss the landing. Yet when we do revenue projections, we're often guessing, making huge assumptions, not using nearly enough data points, not putting in the research time and not triple checking our conclusions. Real commercial pilots look at many data points, analyze changing weather conditions. They have what, what if scenarios for all sorts of unexpected conditions and they calculate, calculate, calculate. They can take and make it look easy because they get hundreds of reps in training and thousands of hours in a career. But most entrepreneurs only ever fly a complete route in business once. So novice, for us, that's the norm. Now this is not a quality revenue projection. And I'm sorry the text is so small, it's just a screen scrape from an actual pitch I saw a few weeks ago. If you can't see it, sales jumped from 3.5 million to over 159 million in one year. And this founder was a 40 something mid-career exec. Anyone remember in math the difference between rational and irrational numbers? A rational number can be expressed as a fraction. You know, one number divided by another one. An irrational number, for example, is like pi. It's a theoretical number, but it seems to work. The point is that a rational number shows a clear relationship between two or more things being measured, and an irrational number requires faith. Do your company projections show clear relationships to sufficient underlying data, or are they numbers that just seem to work? So your fourth takeaway, what is a reliable revenue projection? The more it reflects actual measured quantities and relates them in a cause-dependent way, the better your future projections will be, meaning what actually ends up happening. But the more the numbers in your pro forma are like pi, imaginary, theoretical, requiring faith, can only be tested via a wait and see approach, the more risk you're asking your team and investors to take that you are a brilliant fortune teller. Understand that there is no universal equation that projects sales for all businesses. One of you is flying a jumbo jet to Hawaii, one is flying a single engine float plane in Alaska, one of you is a dune buggy driver, somebody is steering a cruise ship, one's hang gliding or on an airboat, pushing a loaded truck or biking across country. You've each got different generating capacities, loads, weight requirements, energy sources, obstacles, and arrival timelines. You have very, very different businesses. This is just a humor break. The only thing you all share in common is that each of you have many variables to estimate to come up with an exact time of arrival for your business. It's fundamental to knowing how much money it's going to take, which we're also going to conclude with today. But your projections should not be an exercise in circular reasoning. So after today, you need to design and build a revenue projection equation, which is your business's chemistry, with more data points than you've ever used before. But if you do this, it is its own investment with a return because the time you spend doing it now will save you untold time and cost later, pivoting your revenue model every time you miss a milestone or run short on money. Ironically, the more you break your revenue equation down, the simpler forecasting gets. I'm gonna take you through a revenue equation for an old well-known industry so that you understand the equation construction process just to see how it works. It'll be on your own time that you can sit down and think about how you're going to construct or revamp the revenue equation that you're using and add more data points. So this is all about building confidence in your future looking statements and operational decisions. Big Poppy Bicycle Shop is a full service bicycle store. Now remember, you're considering a process here. This isn't a template, okay? You don't need to be writing anything down. A bicycle shop's revenue equation is not going to mirror your industry or your company. And it doesn't need to do for, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to apply your business. 
Okay, but let's walk through it. Very few businesses sell only one thing for one price to one kind of customer. Your business probably has more complexity than that, right? If so, you won't stop with designing just one revenue equation. You're going to make a separate equation for each type of thing you sell. I'm not saying each SKU, I'm just saying each group that behaves in similar ways. So for example, you might distinguish between goods versus services, or you might separate residential from your commercial sales, or between winter and summer gear. It's gonna depend on the kind of industry you're in. Again, there's no universal template, it's just gonna depend on your business, but you need to determine your lines of revenue first. So for our example, the bike shop example, it might do something like this. Construct four revenue equations, one for bicycles, those are complete units, one for parts and accessories, one for apparel, and then one for repair services. But let's start from what you know. If a venture-backed startup today opened a bicycle shop, it might do its projections this way. Stop me if you haven't seen this before. 6.2 billion in bikes is sold in the US annually, but there are a lot of categories from electric to kids and you won't carry all of them. So you whittle it down. And then knowing there are thousands of other shops, although your competitive analysis slide says you're the best, you forecast taking this uber conservative estimate of just 2% of the market. 30 million bucks, that's a hell of a bike shop. And then final step, apply hockey stick. From today's zero dollars of revenue to 30 million. And hey, hockey sticks can double this check mark, so projection's done, right? All done. Or maybe you did this in units because your secret sauce is your price. So you multiply your SOM in units times your price, apply hockey stick for years one to four, and we wonder why we miss. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure many of you try to put more behind your estimations than this. And a few of you need to be honest with yourselves that no, you really don't. But as an investor who has seen upwards of a thousand startup pitches, we rarely get much more detail when asking how you arrived at your numbers. You know what answer I get far more often than a good one? Pick your style. It's often a wink and a nod as if to say, hey, you know, these are just projections. I can't be held to them, but I need to show you investors something. The dead giveaway when you haven't done real CFOing is that your marketing and labor cost projections don't seem to relate to your sales projections. Yet it never seems to occur to an early stage company that investors might intuit that. The venture backed startup bike shop might be space constrained from flooring more than 20 sales staff. Can 20 people sell 4,800 bicycles per year? More like 10% of that if they're all top notch. You know what the universal all industries, all small business average spend is? on marketing annually, 1.5%. Our VC backed bike shop pitch deck might go generous at 2% and never calculate that this is an unbelievable 50 CAC to LTV ratio. If you're not familiar with those ratios, that's a very, very high number, unrealistically high. So if any of you are squirming or itching right now, wondering if your marketing and labor cost estimations line up with all the sales you promise to generate, good. The first step to financial company health is accepting we have a problem. Don't drink the VC world Kool-Aid. Revenue projecting is a program with more than 12 steps and many of you are only doing three or four. So here are 12 steps and this will be in the outline. You don't need to rush to write them down. Here are 12 steps for just little old neighborhood bike shop to get it right. We're gonna walk through this. So just absorb the thought process, okay? Your steps are going to vary and you or someone with CFO-like financial skills needs to design your own variables. Remember, you're going to design equa an equation for each of your revenue streams. So the equation design can vary depending on which one you're working on. So for the bike shop, their step one is to count their customer population. 
one human can ride one bicycle at a time. So the buying entity is an individual over age three. Your company's buying entity could be only adults or homeowners, which include a married couple as one unit, or families, or businesses, or government entities. Who or what buys from you? Once identified, you then determine your largest boundary. This is often a geographical boundary. There are certain regions or countries you plan to sell into, and that's your market area. So for the bike shop, that's where it starts. What's its market area? How many humans that could ride a bicycle live in that area? Some startups think that this is the same thing as TAM, total addressable market. No, it's not. I cringe when I see an electric battery startup, and there are many, claim the crazy huge total automobile industry as their TAM. Really? Do you sell every part of the whole vehicle to the industry? If not, and you recognize you're selling just one of thousands of parts, then your TAM should be the total industry sales of only that part in that configuration. These insane TAMs I see are hype, and we're not fooled. Next variable, not every human being will ride a bicycle. 44% never will. That's a researchable data point for that industry. So have you counted how many of your buying entities are actually participating in your market and are willing buyers? If you're inventing a totally new kind of thing like Facebook once was, then your active buyers might be zero today and you need to generate them. Or you might be developing something that will displace something else already in the market. So go do some research, count the number of current users of that thing. This describes a demographic boundary, not just where it exists, but who it is, which is your market size. If you specify a TAM, it should really be a number of units or dollars in this group. Sure, an investor wants to see a big number, but no matter how big it is, it needs to be a real number. Here's a quick tip. Don't just accept the first answer for a data point that you find. Find as many answers as you can. If you have quite a few, you know, drop out the low and the high, any others that seem suspect and average the rest. Also look for variations on the same question. As you see in this snapshot, the bike shop found data that was broken down by gender. Next variable, how many buyers within the geographic and demographic boundaries are or will be aware of your offering as a possible choice? And this requires either a different kind of research like surveys or a logical financial relationship between your marketing investments and the expected results. So remember just a short time ago when I said that poor revenue projections don't seem to have a relationship to the marketing spend? We're gonna cover that in a little bit. So I hope that several or most of you uh, attended Angelo Ponzi's webinar on Tuesday where he goes into greater detail than I do. But at this point, you can't complete good revenue projections until you've put together a well-constructed marketing plan, which I'm going to get you started on in a bit. It will assemble quantified assumptions about channels of advertising and the expected amount of depth of customer awareness you have to create so that you can plug in a real result here. Thus the marketing boundary or market reach is the number of buying entities that you can make clearly aware of your offering so that they can make a purchasing decision from you. What is that number for this year? What is it for next year and the next year? And so on based on marketing spend and expected results in each year. In a six year period, Big Poppy Bike spent $300,000 across multiple marketing channels and received a 15 to one return on investment in top line revenue. And still, despite great visibility and all that marketing, 30% of the local community within five miles of it had still never heard of it. Now let's break for a, for a fifth takeaway. If you have any CFO-like bone in your body, it should be dawning on you 
that a company's financial model cannot be a set of siloed estimates. Like planets in a solar system, every part of your company's financial plan influences every other part. For example, you need more marketing spend to drive more sales, but you need more sales to afford more marketing spend. You're going to be revising both ends of your model several times until you find a sweet spot. And once you identify it, you need to consider whether you can raise enough capital to fund the plan. Are you all seeing why I put revenue, labor, marketing, and capital planning together into one seminar that's an intro to being a CFO? You can't do any one of these without the other. And if you haven't done them all, then you have no idea whether you can promise eventual profitability. And an investor shouldn't want to invest in that. So the next step in building the equation, how many of those who you make aware of your offer can you get to stop shopping and start buying with you? This is your sales boundary. And what you apply as your closing rate from year to year is a function of many things. It could depend on how distinct and desirable your unique selling proposition is, the talent of your salespeople, the perception of the marketplace, how well established your brand is, whether there's new competitors entering in the market trying to take some from you and more. This can fluctuate over time. It doesn't only go up. So you need to never stop doing two things. One, being honest with yourself, and two, continuously revisiting and revising your projections based on changing conditions. So how often should you be revisiting this? Definitely more than annually, maybe quarterly, more like monthly, sometimes even weekly. So here's another mental takeaway. Poor CFOing is like poor audio mixing for a concert. You can't just set it and forget it. A company financial plan is, it's like a sound field. Every one of these hundreds of controls on the board impacts the output. And if you haven't attended an expensive concert and still been disappointed by the sound, then you haven't had that experience of recognizing how difficult this is. Controlling a business is just as challenging. Now, if you're not up for that, you're already making uh, a serious risk of being in the 90% of startups that won't make it. So here's the next step in the bike shop equation. The average ticket price for this particular revenue stream. This could be per transaction. It could be per purchasing decision. It could be per year. Like, let's say you sell an annual subscription. You need to figure out how to calculate your average ticket across all your buyers, even if they buy different amounts, what will you estimate it to be? For a bicycle shop, $500 could be the average purchase of a bike, but $50 for an accessories purchase or 55 for service. The bike shop knew its numbers. This could entail market research if you're inventing a better mousetrap in a market filled with mousetraps. There should be lots of data available for you. Or if you're introducing a brand new solution then how much does it appear most people are willing to spend to solve it via whatever solution for that exists today? Lots of ways to look at this and you need to balance creative and logical brainstorming approaches. Next step, are you selling pizzas or funeral caskets or app downloads or a replacement knee? Frequency of repeat purchase must be estimated turned into a data point and exist as a variable in your projection equation. For new bicycles in the bicycle business, it fluctuates around one purchase every five to seven years per active rider. So here's a subtotal using data from the first six variables. It shows sort of a raw revenue potential, but the equation's not done yet. There are more variables to continue to refine the revenue equation. A bike shop is in a community. Well, it is that community's population growing flat or shrinking. Sales projections should be modified for future years according to changes in the buying population. And that's no different in your business. Like if you serve bookstores or golf courses or the greatest generation only, your industry is in decline. If you serve shipping and warehousing or clean energy 
then whoever you have identified as the buying entity is probably increasing. Find some industry research that estimates population change and build that into your future looking projections. Here's another step. A bike shop advocates to its community. Aspirational advocacy can convince non-customers to become first-time buyers. This is also no different than your businesses. Maybe you're a cancer therapeutic, and so we aren't talking about more people getting cancer. That's covered in the population growth rate. We are talking about intra-industry trends, like is your immunotherapy approach starting to pull away uh, patients from traditional chemo and radiotherapies into immunotherapies? Or are you improving upon a shrinking AVG dialysis market? Meanwhile, AVF is taking over. These are things you need to take into account. A lot of you are already fined and use a number for compound annual growth rate. We, we call that CAGR all the time. Ever wonder how reliable CAGR is? Have you ever, uh, do you ever go and find past CAGR predictions and compare it with actual? Of course not, who does that? But a lot of industry research is biased because it's paid for by the industries that are benefited by saying nice things about it. I don't prefer these numbers without comparables. CAGR is essentially one that is already taking population participation growth rates into account. But it can be useful as a sanity check. I would love sometimes just add up all the industry CAGRs out there and it would probably show like 100% GDP growth. It's a little crazy. Do you think a bike shop in a four season climate sells the same number of bikes every month? What about rainy years versus drought years? If your business has an annual seasonality or even a multi-annual cyclicality to it that governs when customers will be buying versus not, you better factor for that. The aerospace industry understands this with up and down cycles in commercial and government sectors and multi-year contracts. And what about this? It amazes me how seldom I see inflation accounted for in business models. During the 20 teens, buy prices at wholesale were climbing 10% year over year, while consumer rates of inflation were less than 2%. Do you think that put pressure on its operating margins? So what's happening in your industry? Maybe you enjoy a growing customer appetite willing to pay more and your costs are stable and you would be one of the few lucky ones. Most industries are experiencing rising costs with intense competition, limiting how much they can raise their prices. So you'd better pay attention and account for inflation. And the last step in the bike shop equation, maturity curve. Startups that try to sell me on their rates of sales growth isn't as impressive to me as you think it should be. No matter what rate you're pitching me, you could be telling me 100% year over year, 1,000%, it's arbitrary, it's meaningless. What has meaning is are they growing revenues fast enough to first overcome the marginal concurrent growth and operating costs and the investor costs of financing that growth. If you don't let me see the cost and capital plans with your growth plans, I'm out. It does me no good to invest in a business growing 150% in sales. That sounds great. Meanwhile, your costs are mushrooming 200% a year. Get the point? So with real world modifiers to modify your revenue potential, you should get a lot closer to an actual achievable revenue projection. And once you've designed a main equation for one of your revenue centers, some of those variables may be dependent on still other things. For example, your customer could be the combination of a number of different populations which exhibit different buying behaviors. Or your sale conversion rate may not be singular, but a buildup of a funnel measuring rates of response to an ad. Then from there, percent to demo percent who respond to follow-up, percent who accept the quote, and finally the percent who buy. So you may need to design some sub-equations for any one of your main variables in your primary revenue equation. So is it all worth the effort? 
part of chaos theory and math deals with order in systems that appear chaotic. And the free market certainly appears chaotic to us, right? So the more distinct measurable data points you can put in a prediction equation, and the more sources of comparison you can identify for any of those data points, the more accurate your predictions become. What we're doing is taking the broad sweeping predictions you were making with just two or three data points that were very dependent on other factors and breaking them down into component parts that are easier to individually research and measure then multiply them back together into a much more logically grounded prediction. Some of you need to let this sink in for a while. There's always someone in the room who's resigned themselves to believe that their sales have no useful comparables for the sake of market research or projecting the future. It's a mental block that results from trying to answer a number that's too big with too many influencing variables and you've never thought about breaking it down. Even new industries can gain tremendous insights analyzing established industries that were similarly new at one time and that are likely to have had similar growth characteristics that can be measured and applied to your new industry. But one must be willing to creatively, analytically break down these complex factors into simpler components so that you can measure them or theorize cross comparable industries to find substitute data when the given industry's data is too sparse. So why do CFOs love spreadsheets? Well, it's not because we're geeks. Let me tell you the real reason. It's because we're lazy. Spreadsheets were purpose created to keep us from repeating math just because one variable changed. Imagine the days when one data point changed and you had to recalculate the whole equation from the beginning to update your answer. So here's another secret. If you construct detailed revenue equations for your company, forever after, you will be far more sensitive to the influencing factors on your business and recognize when they change. Be careful to note each source of data you used and periodically check your sources. After your business is generating sales, if you're intentional about collecting customer data to measure how customers arrived at their purchasing decisions with you, then, when you compare your actual sales to your estimates, it's easier to zero in on which of your underlying assumptions deviated the most and further improve your accuracy for continued forecasting. I'm still waiting for the day to be a fly on the wall when someone asks a startup to defend its projections and the CEO rattles off or prints a detailed equation with all the supporting research. That founder might not be able to get out of the room without some crying and being pleaded with to accept a bigger check. Doesn't that sound like more fun than the usual reception? So then why not create it? Do the work. Unless, of course, you can't find the data that leads to the conclusions that builds the equation that proves your faith in your business's potential, and then that's telling you something. Because if that's the case, then I don't get it. Is it just fun to be in such a reckless gambit that even with your own time and money, you're willing to throw caution to the wind and do this thing? Don't you wanna know if this thing's got a good chance of getting off the ground? So I've shown you a sample design. You and your team should sit down and break apart whatever huge sweeping assumptions you've been making and project your sales more um, in detail. No more cutting a metal box, adding doors, an engine, four wheels and a trunk and calling in a new car. Break that engine down to the last minor part. Measure everything and then put your business model back together. Whew. Revenue is the most challenging part of the business model. It gets much easier to deal with the cost centers and capital planning from here. But first I'll take a few burning questions on projecting sales if anybody has any, just throw them in the chat or the Q&A.
And real quick, while I watch for a question, I just wanted to mention that if financial modeling for your business is still something you'd like more hands-on help with, in partnership with Pisno Ventures, I'll be offering a national venture plan competition special edition of my h 2 program. Each company that joins this h 2 board will gain 40 hours of group meeting and lab time where we'll be constructing your business model from the ground up. Now it's limited to 12 non-competing companies. So registering quickly guarantees you a seat. JJ's got a link for that as well as a link to an additional information session about the program. Now we have a, a question. Randy says, I have a full economic model in an Excel spreadsheet, which breaks down many components discussed across a few tabs, including labor required. How do you capture that you did your due diligence in a pitch deck or competition? That's a great question, Randy. So obviously in a pitch deck, you're, you're putting the top level information, the summary, the, the mathematical answers, right? But if you're the one who is using the model, then you should have sort of a, a deep inner uh, understanding of it already. And if you're not, if you have somebody else in your team, you should be bringing that team member to your pitches so that they can help to answer some of those detailed questions. Um, the most important, um, impressive thing to an investor is that you don't just know it on paper, like you gotta go look for an answer and go, oh, okay, I think this is what we decided here. But did you really understand your business model up here? You did the work on the side and paper, and that informed you to help you make intuitive strategic decisions. So I hope that answers the question well enough. We can certainly be in touch after if you wanna talk about that more or come to the HIO session when we finish up in about an hour. Okay, let's switch gears. I told you the hardest part's behind us and I know revenue projecting is kind of like drinking through a fire hose. I try to make it as easy as I can, but these concepts are gonna be simpler. When you open your garage door and you roll out your MVP for all practical purposes, nobody knows your offering exists. So what do you need to do? Hopefully tell somebody, somebody willing to buy what you wanna sell, right? Easy peasy. Buy a list from people who sell leads and start spamming, calling, or lurking on social media, right? Is that how we do this? Or maybe have strangers offer free candy at a trade show? First, let's narrow in on what I mean by marketing here. Because just like accounting versus finance, people are not one in the same. Chief marketing officers and chief sales officers are not the same either. The difference between marketing and selling can be related to revenue planning. Remember when we talked about market reach distinctly from market share? Market reach is making the customer aware of your brand, aware that you might have a solution for their problem, and that's what marketing does. Conversion is the process of negotiating and closing the sale, which is what salespeople do. Marketing builds company image and general customer brand awareness. It creates curiosity, a desire to learn more. It crafts words around core company values and the beliefs about the company it wants customers to buy into. It's concerned with naming the what that it sells, in particular because of the why. It's the business card, the website, the online dating profile, putting your company in the best possible light. Don't know how many of you remember Two-Face Gwen from Seinfeld. But salesmanship takes over from marketing and develops the individual customer relationship. It explains what you're offering, demonstrates that it works, answers objections, asks for the sale. It's the sales call or the e-commerce basket and hopefully not with the personality of this guy. Advertising, whether social, print, or live mediums is a bridge between marketing and sales. Advertising assists with the brand and product awareness building of marketing, but also makes time-specific offers, conveys basic terms of sale, issues specific calls to action. Teeing up, up customers who have begun imagining themselves as customers before they engage with your sales process. Among other things, entrepreneurs get backwards, like projecting sales with insufficient research, 
are hiring their CFO last, startups get this customer acquisition backwards too. They expect to land sales with insufficient advertising investments. I mentioned before that most industries chronically spend less than 2% of their sales on marketing and advertising. But beyond paid advertising, let's consider any message you might craft and deliver to your potential customers. Often inexpertly, startups continuously experiment with potential customers, and they keep changing the company's value story, confusing the marketplace and muddying their own brand image. Most of you pitch with a competitive analysis slide with these arbitrary data points of comparison where your company is straight A's every time. I never see a company say they don't hit all the boxes <laughs> and none of your competitors ever add up. Now, people don't buy best when they've never heard of you before. So if you're leading the market, we're the best, nobody's heard of you before, they don't believe that claim. But they might give you a shot if you're different in interesting ways. So if you can imagine an exciting, compelling marketing campaign designed around only the features on your chart that you rated yourself well in, then that's a real opportunity. But if you go back and look at those features on your chart that you're the only one who does it well, and it would be hard to design an ad campaign around that and turn heads, then you need to develop some better differentiators to go to market with than you've produced so far. So how does the CFO bean counter work with the CMO and CSO creatives? If your marketing department only wants to spend on your, and your CFO only wants to save, then I'm gonna tell you, you probably have an accountant wearing CFO clothes. The financial marketing and sales departments should all want the same thing, more revenue. The CFO can help the CMO quantify their plans in dollars and validate expected revenue growth, which pushes marketing personnel to up their creative game even more. The creative team, in turn, helps inform the CFO of when investments need to be made and how long to wait for the results so that operating capital can be comfortably managed. Small business owners often lose or don't have much faith in marketing spend to begin with because they don't know how to craft an effective message that grabs the attention of the most likely buyers. Trying to save money, they DIY it with haphazard short-term decisions without a governing long-term strategy. They pull back in frustration or pivot the message and the audience wildly when they don't see hoped for sales quickly coming through the door like not believing that accurate revenue projections are possible to construct either. They don't believe accurate estimates of marketing results are possible. But like accurate revenue planning, to get the marketing plan under control, it needs to be quantified in detail and skillfully implemented by those possessing the necessary expertise. If you don't already have a good marketing plan outline, I'll provide a seven stage planning template you can use. It's periodic, it's repeatable. Usually, though after a lot of companies, you might use it on an annual basis, but it could vary depending on your industry's sales cycle length. Strategic and financial decisions come in the early stages of planning, while the creative effort finishes it out, drives it home. So as with revenue projecting, this isn't the lab session, okay? You'll need to adapt this process to your unique company needs then do the work or sign up for H2D if you want additional tools and assistance with marketing planning along with other business modeling needs. So here's stage one of the seven stage marketing plan. When building a plan, I recommend that your executive team be in retreat, no interruptions. This is just a focused discussion and planning time. So stage one is pretty simple and it's profoundly important. First half is determine how many months this marketing plan will be in effect. What will be the start and the end date? Are you meeting in December to form the plan for January through December of the next year? And the second half is the foundation of the plan. What is your top line sales goal? Or if this is easier, what net top line sales growth do you want to achieve as a result of this plan? 
Now you can always go back and modify this number, but start by agreeing to a number that's a stretch, yet should be achievable. Note that by the time the plan is complete, this sales goal will determine and support the numbers back up in your sales projections. Stage two of a great marketing plan asks, what should you spend in order to ensure you hit the sales goal in stage one? Now, you can use industry precedents, but be careful. Uh, a, a good CMO might know this or can find it out, but the reason you need to be careful is that in whole industries historically don't spend enough on marketing. It's a chronic problem. So also, you, you need some expert advice. Somebody who knows what to spend in what ways to hit the audience you're trying to hit and get the numbers you're trying to get. And you can work in fixed dollars, but if that's not easy until later stages to get started, you could maybe just pick a percentage of total sales. So we want to grow sales 25% and we're going to spend 5% of total sales to get there. And well, actually one respected author in this space suggests that most businesses are going to be between six to 12% of hoped for sales. So then should your business be near the low or the high side of a range like that or in the middle, you know, because 1% of sales can still be a big number. So I'll help you kind of think through that. Durable goods purchased less often, like bicycles, they tend to be on the low side. If you're selling a high frequency consumable like pizza, you need to be spending more on marketing. Here's another scale. If you're, in a, if you're a mature, well-established brand, you've already, you're already a market leader in your space, well, then you can be more conservative. You don't need to spend quite as much. But almost all of you, if not every single one of you, is in a new business that hasn't quite gone to market yet or, is, or isn't known by a lot of customers yet. So you need to invest more. And this applies to companies that only sell locally in most cases, but is location a factor for your business? If you're paying the higher rent for higher visibility, well, then you're buying some marketing and you don't need to spend as much more on advertising. But if you're off in a corner of town someplace and no one can see you from the road, you got to invest more. And finally, the more specialized or distinctly unique what you sell is and where you have few competitors, the less you need to spend. But if you're in a highly commoditized industry and you have lots of competitors, then you're probably going to have to spend quite a bit more. So this just gives you some thinking and how you determine how to pick that percentage of sales to budget for marketing. So let's move on to stage three. Stage three in marketing planning, we determine demographically which groups of customers we want to drive our new sales from because you can't reach everybody. And so this can be groups you're already doing well with, but with a lot of room to grow, uh, to be sort of a vertical expansion. Or it could be groups that represent horizontal customer expansion. You know, a bike shop might want to increase its market share with weekend warrior enthusiasts, or it doesn't really have much BMX business right now, and it wants to expand into that audience with a new messaging to those kinds of buyers. So for this exercise in your marketing retreat, you're not trying to figure out which is the best one right now. You're just trying to identify all the potential target markets you could choose to go after. And it could be a long list, okay? It's a brainstorming list. No idea is wrong, put them all on the table. Next, once you've identified this list of potential target audiences you could pursue, most businesses will find it can't pursue them all within the budget. So the second half of this stage is a rigorous discussion amongst your team to argue for where you believe the most lucrative next opportunities lie, and then come to a consensus. Rank those target audiences in terms of your best opportunity to your least opportunity for that cycle. Those opportunities near the top will end up becoming the focus of this marketing plan, and the rest will be put on the shelf to be reconsidered in the next plan. Be careful to consider additional costs 
that you incur with expanding into new audiences. For example, if you want to reach a non-English speaking population, are you going to need to hire in language staff that you don't currently have? How will that impact the net profitability of targeting that group? Or if you want to consider a target audience that requires carrying more inventory, do you have the real estate, the storage space? Will you need to acquire more? Ranking one target audience may be relatively simple for some businesses, but it could require more detailed study for others. So we're at the midpoint, stage four of a marketing plan in this template. Um, you will have ranked your audiences through the end of stage three. Stages one to three are often more led by the finance guy or gal. With stage four, we begin to transition and the marketing leader starts to come in and guide the rudder and advise. They advise the team about the best method or combination of methods for reaching the target audiences in your ranked list. They advise about, well, what channels, what mediums of, of communication work best for this audience. At the same time, estimations are made about how often the messages would need to be repeated. You know, if you, if you, if you uh, plan a radio ad once, it's not gonna do much. You gotta hit it often and help that, those listeners hear it off over enough until they start to dial in. Then at stage five, with the CFO now relegated to running the calculator, the CMO takes job specific knowledge and experience to estimate the costs of one or more messaging campaigns across all mediums necessary to satisfy each ranked opportunity. A multi-day break in the planning may be necessary here if you need to do more costing research. Once complete, it becomes a relatively academic exercise to start from the top of the list and, and determine how many opportunities can fit into the budget of this marketing cycle. And this could be an iterative process, which means that any previous stage may be revisited to adjust the sales goal, adjust the budget, adjust the campaign design, look at the related costs, and kind of try to kind of arrive at a place where you have the best bang for the buck in your plan. When the team is satisfied and they like the plan so far, then you move on to stage six, with campaigns chosen and budgeted, each campaign now needs to be planned. Gantt charting software can be really helpful here, or just a giant paper calendar. For each target audience and messaging campaign, determine the optimal date for its launch. For each long running campaign that may feature a variety of content, say you're gonna do a series of TV ads, think like Geico, you're not seeing the same ad over and over, they routinely change it. Well, each new content swap out date needs its own timeline. Regardless, backfill the schedule for each campaign that includes launch date, content, or art due date, production start date, design date, etc. What you're doing is you're planning out the work so you're not always in crisis mode, trying to get your marketing in place. And so then all that remains in stage seven is to simply appoint those who will watch the calendar and manage the execution of the plan like clockwork. The planning team should hold a series of update meetings throughout that cycle or that plan period and ensure design and production is on schedule and make adjustments based on early sales results. The last task to execute is to set the date of the next marketing planning meeting and ensure the team knows what research and data needs to be gathered ahead of time for the next planning retreat. So to close this segment, you can understand why the role of finance includes being closely involved in the earlier steps of regular marketing planning. Capital availability informs the budget available for marketing, and yet the amount of marketing capital invested yields a return in sales that increase future capital available. It's circular, and this is a push and pull that needs to be negotiated and settled so that the company financial model and projections reflect more accurate bottom line results for the future. So feel free to ask any questions about marketing. Looks like a couple of others have come in. Let's take a look. Uh, 
how much effort should be put into revenue modeling when you're in a life science startup where revenue is expected to be seven to 10 years away and the likely exit is acquisition? That's a great question. I normally get that question. Life sciences is an excellent example of an industry that takes the longest. And much of the time you're gonna exit before you get to this place. Now, here's what I would argue. If you don't have a theory for how what you're inventing, testing, going through the regulatory process of, is going to be profitable for the person who ultimately buys you out, then why should they give you a serious look? So you should have some theory of how excellently profitable your invention's gonna be, that you've properly protected it with IP, and then that's gonna be a long cash opportunity for somebody to pay you a great price. Now you might not go into the same rigor, but I would suggest that you should do some of this at a high level so that you have a theory of why what you're doing is gonna be worth buying from you. Also a question, would a sigmoid growth curve be a good equation for revenue growth and subsequent flattening? So I have a music degree and I don't love crazy math. I had to make all of this simple for me and I'm sharing that with co-CEOs and COOs who don't love math either. I have no idea what a sigmoid growth curve is, but I do know that there are lots of projection algorithms that people sometimes use to project sales, and I've never found one that meets with reality because it's really only looking at backward information. I much rather do the harder think work of really examining the future of my own market and coming up with my own equation, which then is just multiplication. It's nothing fancy. So hopefully that answer doesn't disappoint, but I'm a simple CFO. How do you account for possible affiliate programs which are free as long as we can get people to be affiliates for us? So I think of affiliate marketing as sort of almost like outsourced contract labor, right? And much of the time, one of the things you have to consider is, is it an even trade? You know, are they getting some amount of equal value from you as you're trying to get from them? Um, a lot of times there's not. And so these affiliate programs don't really last. A really simple version of this and say the bike shop example would be, I'm gonna put some bike shop brochures on the restaurant counter down the street and then I'll take some of their brochures and put them on mine. That would almost be like, you know, a really rudimentary old fashioned form of affiliate marketing. But those things just kind of get pushed to the side and buried. You're never really talking to your customer about the business down the street. So is it really working? But it's an interesting thing to be talking about. And I think there would be a larger conversation there um, that we could have. Okay. So we're right on time. Let's keep chugging away and move into labor planning. What, what good is it to build a great solution and tell customers about it, but when they come ready to buy, you can't give them a stellar end-to-end -end experience? I'm not talking only about sales staff. The sales organization needs the support of the marketing and service folks who need the support of the product development and engineering folks who need the support of the supply chain and contracting functions. And across all of that are layers of decision-making and administration and management. The price we pay for anything, anything, is labor. It's not goods and materials. Think about it. When you pay for overnight shipping, you're not paying for the plane and the fuel. You're paying for the labor of tens of thousands of people who built the plane and a whole industry of people who extract and refine oil. All of your input costs for materials are really labor. The sun's energy, minerals, the power extractable from moving rivers or wind, it's all there, it's free for the taking, but getting it and making it available to someone else who can combine it with other things and sell it to somebody else to combine it with still more things and produce something unique, it's 100% manual human effort and everyone needs to be paid to do their part so they can buy the other things they need. Now this may seem like an elementary review of economics, but a lot of us have forgotten the early lessons. Founders break themselves trying to DIY as much as they can before building the team out a little bit more 
and hoping these first hires will work hard to avoid having to hire again too soon. And it's easy to understand why. We people beings are expensive and have needs. If you need an ego check, here's one. Your best day at the office is selling for a very high price, something you paid somebody else almost nothing for. How do you feel about that? Well, regardless of how you might feel, if I'm profiting on customer ignorance, not my own ingenuity, then that doesn't tend to satisfy me. Without a doubt though, if someone's ignorance makes that possible, somebody someplace is going to take advantage of it. We can't have free markets without allowing for spots of inefficiency. And I love this picture. Price gouging is illegal following a declared state of emergency. Any other time, it's perfectly fine. Actually, the legal principle in our country is generally to let the buyer beware. For me, I prefer to profit from doing something that isn't easy for someone else to imitate or do as well or as efficiently as I can because it makes a more sustainable business. All economics is a labor market. How much would your cell phone cost if the full-time worker building it made more than the current three to $600 per month that they get paid. But now let's come back to that problem of when we need work done and we don't like paying for it. Does that generally result in great results or can it backfire? In some of the popular startup sectors of IT, software and computer games, you turn over your entire workforce every seven to eight years. So I'll say again that if you're not quantifying, measuring, planning and reviewing your plan for people, just like your plan for sales and for marketing, you might be costing yourself a lot more than the time you think you're saving by operating from your gut. We tend to hire only after there's pain. and You know how it goes. You or another team member is burning the candle at both ends, desperate for relief. A position description gets cobbled together for work that you want to hand off to someone. You do ads and interviews, you hire from the best available options in the moment, and that's if you can find any qualified people. And now you can look forward to the future of more of this, rinse, recycle, repeat. And with talent shortages in a number of key disciplines, you may be worried every day that someone plucks one of your team. But you survive and grow, and someone is tasked more formally at some point with being the CHRO. Time to professionalize the HR department. So let's look around the office, who do we have? What do they do? When everyone no longer knows what everyone else does, if not a lot sooner than that, somebody's gonna to decide to make an org chart. They take a labor inventory and put in boxes, arrange them in the way that it seems like work is getting done today and the way decisions are flowing. And then here's the chart. And virtually next week, especially in fast growing startups, the chart already becomes outdated or ignored. Describing the job of someone you need to hire after you need it and graphing the function of your labor force after it is organically formed is the enemy of planning and it's backwards. That's not labor planning because the planning was non-existent. It's better called treading water and I don't recommend it. How should you plan for labor costs proactively and enjoy happier employees while also maximizing labor cost efficiency? Look, it's really not that difficult. Remember, I've got a music degree, not one in human resources. So I needed this to become easy for me to follow. And again, this is just the top page of a blueprint. Whether or not you'll need additional outside help or already have a capable CHRO, your job is to customize this to your company and put it to work. So good labor planning has three elements and I put them in this order. An organizational plan, that's a long-term plan, specifically designed role descriptions, and then a custom designed compensation plan. Now, after running multiple organizations, it finally dawned on me one day that chasing the company with the chart is dumb. The company should be growing into your chart. So if you're a VC backed startup and you're looking to design your chart as an, an envision how it should look before you sell the company, or if you're a lifestyle business with an unlimited path of growth, then you should maybe work in five-year increments. 
Either way, look out into the future. Where will your comp how will your company look and what people will be a part of it when you're looking to exit or before you get to the next five year planning period? Start from a blank slate. Mentally fire everybody, including yourself. If you got to do this from scratch, what's the sales forecast for that ultimate year? Um, use some sticky notes. Uh, what are the types of non-managerial work you need to be done in the company when it's achieved the ultimate scale? Brainstorm that. And then organize all your notes and functional groupings that might say fall under a director level leader. Okay, so you have people today, but you anticipate getting to 60 or 100 before you get to that ultimate sales state or you know, exit date. So start to just take sticky notes and decide at that scale, what are all the things that need to get done in the company and arrange those into groupings. Now decide how many hours of work per week you think that function is going to take on each sticky note. One function could require more than 40 hours. So you're gonna need more than one headcount to satisfy it. And you need to allow for administrative time. No one who works a 40 hour job does only the core duties every minute at work. So if you think they need five hours of overhead, eight hours of overhead, whatever it is, subtract that from the 40, and divide that into the total hours of work you think that function's going to need. Round that up and that gives you, here's the number of headcount for that function. Put that in the corner of the sticky note, that number. And when you're done with this brainstorming function, you're gonna have this bunch of sticky notes, each representing a job function, each noting how many bodies are needed, sort of grouped up, and it's time to add the leadership layers for decision-making. If your company's gonna stay small, like say a medical science company that's only gonna have a half dozen people, you're really only gonna have one management layer, right? But if you're growing a company that say is gonna have customer service agents and installation agents, and it's gonna be you know, quite a few people, you may need to envision teams with managers and groups with directors and several groups under a vice president. But you're, you, what you get to do here, and it's fun, is design it from scratch for the future, not based on what happened over a period of years organically. Find a software tool that you like and commit your design work to something that you can nicely print and easily update. Draw the lines of authority and dotted lines of communication or to outsourced functions, and then just have one or two word role titles in each box. Put that number of head count in the corner of each box where you have multiple workers needed, and now you have a manageable chart. And once that's been designed, now you rehire yourself and your whole crew and fill out all the boxes based on who's doing what today. If you're in a young startup with five people and you're on your way to 75 people, then each of you may be in 15 boxes. But right now that's how it's working because each of you is doing a low volume of work and a wide variety of tasks. As the business grows and the volume of each task increases, the existing staff can become more specialized and hire others to start delegating to. And this is the fulcrum. Which box, whether it has a name or it's blank, will be the next hire you make? Then which one after that? And then which one after that? From now on, until your ultimate state when the whole org chart is filled, put all of your hires in order of when you anticipate needing them. And lastly, remember with marketing how we backbuilt the schedule to ensure all your marketing campaigns were executed orderly and on time? Well, we do the same with labor like this. For each future hire, what is that like level of sales or that company milestone that triggers really needing to have that person in place? What's a, what's a rough month or date on that? Now, in order for them to be there and ready to go, how much time do you need to recruit, interview, and train? So you're kind of creating a Gantt chart of all the future hires 
of your company. And your CHRO now all only needs to watch company performance, anticipate when the next person is needed based on your company plan. And then as those milestones are hit, the business is never caught shorthanded. So there's so many good reasons for planning labor out this way. First, crisis makes us inefficient. We don't wanna be just hiring based on you know, being overworked. And second, hiring is often needed ahead of the sales that sustain it. So you've gotta be able to see what capital will be needed to make your hires, and that flows into the capital plan, which we're gonna end with today. Without an intentional long-term plan, org charts can form organically, and this is a real problem. Some of us may have worked in large companies where we've experienced this. Individual employee self-interests tend to create territories and turf wars. If you let the employees determine the org chart, you're gonna have a lot of problems to solve. And when you do that, it constantly disrupts the organization because you're always reorging, trying to haphazardly plan labor around what's already happening. So we wanna avoid all that with proper planning. And all of this improves investor confidence when we can see that you know exactly what you're gonna spend, you know why, and you know how much money you need. With a long-term master org chart, the second element of excellent labor planning is custom design of job roles. The goal here is to create a library of detailed job descriptions that go with each of the boxes in your chart. So I developed a template that I use in companies with clients today and after summarizing the role and explaining where it sits in the organization, it distinguishes in detail between the regular duties, the acquired qualifications and training, and desired personal traits. And the key difference between those last two is that you can teach people or train people qualifications, but you can't easily teach them to be a certain way. You can't teach personality. Okay? This is really helpful to include this when you're hunting for a position because by telling somebody, here's who I'm looking for, a lot of times folks who probably aren't gonna work out well for you will self-select themselves out of applying. So this library of detailed job description, descriptions supporting the master organizational chart builds a comprehensive labor plan and this has a lot of benefit to you. By designing all of the job positions there's a symmetry, there's not collision and overlap, or there's not gaps missing. And when it's time to make the next hire in your plan and you can pull that job description out and use it to advertise the open position, then it's just off the shelf. You don't have to constantly rewrite these job ads. But the positive impact on employees is tremendous because you know, what do government policies, the stock market and supply chains all have in common? When there's uncertainty, business decision-making stalls, and that's always bad for business. We keep trying to find the magic formula for attracting and keeping happy employees so they don't stall. Without going into all the ways we do that, I've discovered that what gives employees the best chance of job satisfaction is crystal clarity and the expectations of their roles and their opportunities. And so it became my habit that with every interviewee and hire, I give them this entire labor plan for my company. I want them to see where the company is going, what the future career opportunities are within it, and I want every holder of a box to know exactly what's expected of them. And here's a huge tip. Never ever promote someone ahead of their qualifications and task competence, detailed in the description of the higher position they seek. A lot of folks will promote somebody into a position they're not ready for and want them to learn as they go, and it always backfires. Employees tend to get puffed up with, I'm this title now, and yet they don't really know how to do the job and don't apply themselves to fully ever learning it. So make them prove it before you give it to them. So we come to the final element of labor planning, and that's blended compensation. And this is one I have the biggest curveball to throw at you. Why do equity compensated executives and their employees often find themselves pulling in opposite directions? Well, the answer is so right under our noses that we miss seeing it. Think about it. You're hoping to generate a big stock return. 
the company is at risk of failure and revenue solves most problems. So you're always trying to get more, more customers, more sales, more opportunities, more scale, more press, more productivity. What do employees focus on? They want to get done with the task, achieve endpoints, knock off for the day, getting to the weekend. Why? Well, most salary and wage earners who receive straight compensation really have no quantified reason to help the company make them busier, do they? They're paid X to do Y. And is it any wonder why many shoot for Y and nothing more? Your own experience as an employee is a poor filter for understanding how employees think. And I say that because I'm talking to a room full of entrepreneurs and it took me many years to accept this myself. Our experiences as employees are poor filters because we don't understand how these employees think because we go for stuff. That's why we're business owners, we're ambitious, okay? Most people are not like us. Even when higher level positions are available that pay more, it's remarkable how much of the workforce is not really lifestyle motivated enough to exert great effort to attain a higher paying position. Now we don't understand that. To be clear, there are plenty of workers who will happily accept more pay for continuing to do the same job and our lack of planning and setting clear expectations enables that. Now we can't change who people are, but we can motivate them differently. And here's the bright side. We don't want most employees to be like us because if they were, we couldn't hang on to them. Their ambition would drive them into starting their own things. We need a base of employees to ride in the wake of our ambitions without the heartaches you and I must admit come along with our roles of balancing and steering the board. But it's about as easy as what these folks are trying to do. We can't overtly push them to be more like us, so they'll fall off. And we can't spoil them with rewards beyond what their work is worth or the imbalance will rob you of the ability to maintain control of the craft. The ones we catch who want to move up make themselves known. They might get a bit ahead of their skis at times, but as a manager, I'd rather have these folks who want to learn and grow. A lot of the folks, though, that I've had work for me are content to just dip their feet in and avoid getting wet. And this can be true of anyone at any time. It can apply to team managers, directors, even junior executives. Everyone has their limit for how far they wish to go. And they contend with those who want to go further and maybe sometimes shouldn't even be allowed. This condition within a company of people pulling in different directions can be dramatically improved. And yet so few companies learn how. So the tool that I use is blended compensation. Here's how it works. There's a base wage for showing up. And that should just basically be what is the market value of doing the minimum job. Then you add a variable component and this should be paid out at, at least monthly or not less than quarterly, which is pegged to the company's performance at meeting goals, which the employee's work contrib contributes to. Now that's important. The payout, happen, the payout needs to happen in shorter than annual cycles. Rewarding work that's still in recent memory. That helps workers understand the symbiotic relationship between their performance and the companies. It's not a bonus, you should never call it that. Most people today think of a bonus, other than a, maybe a small surprise one, uh, as something you get every year and it's just, it becomes an entitlement and it quickly loses its ability to motivate. It's not profit sharing like bonuses, they also, profit sharing tends to become entitled, just built into what employees think of as what they expect to earn in a year. You never want blended compensation to appear like regular pay. They must, they must always understand they're getting paid for doing something extra in that period. And both bonuses and profit sharing typically lack the ability to you know, motivate specific different behaviors that change over time because they're only based on one thing, which is annual net profit. That might be achieved or missed for economic reasons that are beyond any of the employee's control. And yet rewarding or punishing employees with bonuses and profit sharing all the same, I really don't like those popular tools. Blended compensation is not a commission. Commissions typically only apply to sales jobs and post-revenue companies anyway. 
and I don't like commissions in general for a number of terrible behaviors they naturally incentivize, which I can't get into deeply today, but just understand that blended compensation is a superior model and it can be used not only in the sales department, but across all the departments of employees you have. And finally, this is not stock options or equity. Company equity should only be held by those who take investment or liability risk. That doesn't mean stock options or ESPPs can't be used, but they can, they, what they do is they aren't buying extra effort. Stock is for investing cash, investing work without being paid for it or sweat equity, or investing IP or being, or being prosecutable if the company does something wrong. So equity should never be a form of awarded compensation for work. That confuses workers. One must take risk to earn profit. One must work to earn wages. Blended compensation are part of the wages. And small companies with one or two layers of management, these periodic goals are set at the executive level for everybody. But they can be set at a division level or even departmentally depending on the size of the company. No matter what the goals, they must be achievable within that cycle and yet significantly impact the company in the eyes of customers or investors such that not accomplishing them would get noticed. And this is another key. The goals must be measurable by the employees so they can track their progress as they work day to day, throughout the month, throughout the quarter. That's one reason why annual bonuses and profit sharing based on actual profit lose a lot of their motivational power throughout the year as most employees have no idea how the company's P&L is shaping up and they're not privy to the books. Trust me, the first time employees don't get the, the Christmas bonus, they've already spent ahead of time, they won't be thinking, oh shucks, I'll work harder next year. Things get a little crazy. Finally, and why this isn't like commission pay, the rewards must be pursued together and shared together by teams of people, never awarded individually. One of the destructive influences of commissions is without strict territory boundaries, two or more salespeople with access to the same customer tend to work against each other, against the company's best interests, and sometimes even against the customer's best interests. There are good reasons why we all hate new car shopping at traditional dealerships. We'll leave that industry open to online disruption. There's a lot of design complexity in blend, designing a blended compensation plan. I'm not saying this is something easy to do. Every business has a fingerprint and no plan that works for one company can just be systematized to work well for all the others. So if you don't have the CRTRO capable of doing this, find a consultant willing to help you in the design and add this to your master labor plan. By rewarding your employees to think about what you're thinking about this month, this quarter, and sharing with them in the good things that happen, you align employee interests and that of your equity comp compensated um, executives. The whole point is to gain uncommon labor efficiency versus your competitors because your employees are working differently at a higher level versus your competitors' employees. You only pay the blended compensation out after getting the benefit of what the goals were that you incentivize them with. So it's a riskless win-win for the company and its employees. The worst that can happen is what would have already happened without it. It motivates those employees stuck in ruts of marginal productivity, adding fire where it was missing before. And at the same time, it manages the natural fires of the ambitious employees because it's putting periodic goals in front of them that they can achieve in order to get paid more. And finally, Backwards, when employees are partly compensated for team performance, it dampens the tendency to overfluff one's own contributions or denigrate another's. Someone who really doesn't have their oar in the water will stick out for management attention and find it tough to form alliances among underachievers. And I really wonder, you know, how much of the multi-billion dollar HR education book and conference industry constantly helping us solve workplace misalignment because we walk into it. Seems to me psychology can only go so far. Humans remain human. And with a long range org chart, clear role descriptions and a financial reason to row in the same direction as the executives, 
management can save a lot of money being spent by their customers putting out the usual human resource fires. So how does the CFO bean counter work with the CHRO hall monitor? Well, finance is critical at the table in labor planning because timing is the need, timing and the need for investments in labor and in the office space, equipment, communications, infrastructure, and travel budgets needs to be accounted for so that HR has the payroll budgets in place when hiring. And meanwhile, HR can help finance anticipate and quantify the revenue gains they should be achieving by adding more human effort aimed at satisfying customers. Using the business model tool I created for clients called Sybil, which is a mythical Greek name from Prophetus, my clients learned that the most important calculated row in the workbook is not month or year end profit. Profitability is certainly the mechanism from which the balance sheet and wealth ultimately grows. But in H2D, I lay out all the reasons that profitable companies can still go bankrupt. We can go into that in detail. We don't go into that in detail here, but suffice it to say that managing cash, and particularly in early stages until sustainable profitability is achieved, is what keeps your doors open. Without positive cash flow, there is no opportunity for the business to generate profit. Profit can have times of being both positive or negative. The cash flow can never be negative. That's a hard stop. Negative cash flow means belly up the first time every time. If your car's gas tank goes dry in a situation pictured, you can blame a leak, the gauge, absent-mindedness, whatever the reason. Gas stopped entering the combustion chamber and after the last drop, the car can't get where it needs to fill up. It stops until you get more gas. So we're moving now into where it all comes together, the capital plan. How much money do you need to get to exit? There's ultimately only one reason that businesses fail unintentionally, despite the many precursors leading up to it. They ran out of cash. And there is a finance term for this. It's not this one. The chief job of your finance officer is to keep predicting when you're going to run out. The rest of the team might resist facts, overspend, not listen to advice, but just like the car, when you're out, you're out. You can get a customer advance, you can try to get an owner to loan more funds or find a new investor, but when you're done, you're done. You probably won't prevent what you can't foresee. And before March, when the world allowed me to do live speaking, I would sometimes take a room of business leaders and start picking them out at random and ask them, as of right now, if you don't make any new sales or receive any new equity investment, then what's your death date? Even those that had an answer for their profit forecast for the next year couldn't answer their death date. They didn't know. They don't look at their cash flow statements. Some of them don't even create them. You know what's funny about that? Every company is going to run out of cash, always. It has an expiration date until the next creditor debit to the accounts, and then it moves either closer or farther away. Knowing this isn't hard. How much cash do you have in the bank? How much are you spending in every period, like a week or a month that you have to spend? It's simple math, folks. We should always know what our cash runway is, just like you should always know how many fuel miles left you have on a long drive. The reason this topic is last is the same reason row 41 on this sheet in Sybil requires 8,000 other formulas first. It can't be done any earlier. Everything else has to be figured out and calculated before you can project cash. So if you haven't completed the planning and the other aspects of your business financial model, you can't calculate your death date. We must do our revenue and our marketing and our labor forecasting and in other areas and put it all in the model. Conditions and assumptions change all the time though, right? Just one major change in assumptions for any of the important areas of your model could impact the death date. But you can make the change in a spreadsheet and all the 8,000 bits of math are done for you. I'm invested in a startup called Quick. It fills employment shifts for restaurants. And some of you may know of it. It was really doing quite well until the pandemic. 
a lot of forecasting assumptions changed overnight. But Quick has excellent management, which is part of why I invested. Under a lot of other CEOs, this company would already be belly up, but they had a model and they knew how much money they had, what they were obligated to spend and what they had to do by the numbers. And I just got a report from them that this September was higher than their last pre-pandemic September. And that's pretty impressive. So do you wanna be the CEO that knows right where you are every day? Or when a black swan event hits you, you won't know what to do to survive. Roll the dice and whatever happens, happens, right? What kind of CEO do you wanna promise your investors that you are? Even if that's only friends and family or maybe especially because that's friends and family. I've been an advocate at the federal level for probably over 25 years. And one of the top three perennial policy um, uh, problems that keeps coming up is access to capital. And if you're an intelligent species from the stars and you came and you observed everything we're doing here, you might think, well, gee, this is great. We have so many companies willing to do so many great things. So there just must not be enough money, right? Well, if that's true, I'm gonna tell you it's not true. I'm gonna tell you what is true. There's always enough money. In every recession, depression, boom or bust, country or time frame and modern trade, there has always been enough money for the businesses with solid plans. In fact, so much capital is available that nine out of 10 businesses that get funded fail. They didn't have good plans. Now, wait, I'm not, am I saying the idea doesn't matter only having a great plan? Of course not, that'd be ridiculous. What I'm saying is that in many cases, startups want investors to pay them to find out if an idea is going to sell with no obligation to pay them back if it doesn't. Government can definitely streamline regulations, but every time I bring focus in DC on funding to better entrepreneurial education, I don't get very far. Why do you think that might be? Maybe I'm wrong, but it could be that entrepreneurs would rather ask for easier funding than more rigorous education. Despite making some hard points, this topic is really rather easy. You should include the acquisition costs of your capital equipment. You should look at real estate that you need. You should consider the timing of and, and anticipated loan disbursements, the cash out to cover principal and interest payments. You should look at the additional investments that founders plan to make or that you're gonna get from other insiders and the planned additional costs of research. You put all of this into your plan and then you add in downside risk scenarios and figure out what your likely and possible death dates might be. And with a 10,000 foot view then, you can go up to the top and determine when you need to raise money. And it should be 12 to 18 months prior to a given death date. It takes time to raise it and you wanna build in time for unexpected negative occurrences. If you're raising money right when you're out, investors get scared and think that they're just doing a rescue. So I'm gonna kind of skip past some of this because we're running out of time. But I will tell you that some of the best pitch presentations I see not only give me the cash runway for the business out years ahead, but it also gives a high and a low so that I get a sense of what my ROI is based on the amount of money that the company plans to raise. I wanna know, how are you gonna use the proceeds from this round? What valuation are you using right now and how did you justify it and when are you gonna be raising money again? Someone's thinking, hold on, I see companies that don't seem to have a good plan and they get pumped up and raise ludicrous cash from big VCs. You're right. It happens to a lottery lucky number of startups every month. And you've also seen what can happen. This webinar and many others being offered with this, you know, to, to the, this group and the competition has far more valuable, are far more valuable than the money that you can win here and the exposure you get to angel investors here 
um, are going uh, where you have an opportunity to get in front of some investors um, is going to be worth much more than the money that you can win. Now you may just be offering cruises around Jupiter's rings, but if your business plan doesn't allow you to charge what customers can pay, your plan isn't worth a thing. Maybe you're making something unsexy like a new shoe manufacturing machine, but if it adds five years of life to customer shoes, that could be a knock it out of the park hit. In closing, George is the unemotional equalizer of all the claims and promises, and he doesn't care who you said what to about your idea. You've got to show us your idea is going to make money and have thought through every detail the company exit, that the potential upside outweighs the risks and that you have built in plenty of margin for error because it will take twice and cost twice as much as you thought it would. Not knowing how to do the work is fixable, but not believing it's necessary or not being willing to do it is not fixable. Finance and the planning of practices is not worth the cactus's thorns. From my neck in the country, it's the water from a desert the cactus has to keep the plant alive. So figure out who your CFO type is or find one. And once again, we'll be offering a follow-up program for those who need it, and you'll be able to get those details from JJ. So sorry, JJ, I'm four minutes over, but uh, happy to do some questions here. Happen to, happy to move over to HIO to do that as well. It's all good. Um, thank you so much. Wow. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> this is good stuff. Um, you touched on a lot of things. I, I didn't know you were going to go into these different areas, but that was that's really great. Uh, anyone with questions still uh, that uh, Jeff can answer? Uh, you can raise your hand, I know, um, or you can uh, put it in the Q&A. Uh, Sandrine, are you still interested in asking a question? Because uh, I know you had your hand raised for a while. Uh, just let us know. Okay, you put it down. Uh, anyone? Did you see a question from earlier okay. about uh, address? Uh, how to address, uh, address licensing with major industries? Um, for example, a patent in the telecom space. Uh, Adrian, if you're still with us, can you clarify your question a little bit as far as, as uh, what you're looking for there? Yeah, I see Adrian. In terms of what you mean by addressing licensing. Adrian, you can raise your hand. I'll bring you in via uh, audio if you want. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Well, Jeff, you, you really touched on a lot of different areas. Um, and uh, I, I really liked what you said about, um, you know, someone who, uh, how do you compensate people? Uh, if they're just doing their job nine to five, then it is nine to five. That's it. There's no risk. They're going to they're gonna produce why, and that's why you expect them to produce why they're not willing to do any more. That's pretty cool. It's a chronic problem that faces most industries, and it's amazing that we haven't solved it with something simple like this. But when I've implemented uh, blended compensation programs for companies, I have seen sales grow double-digit percentages in the next 12 months because all of a sudden everybody was rowing in the same direction. Yep. Uh, Deepu has a question. You want me to read it? Uh, I see it? Okay. Yeah, please do. I, I don't see the question. I only see the little red number. <laughs> oh, it says, if you are selling worldwide, is it okay to just combine the whole market or do we still need to show territory boundaries? Good question. So it's kind of a question about, you know, how many revenue columns do I need to build or how many equations, right? If you have a very, very uniform offering, you know, like you sell one app, and only the same kind of people buy that one app, but you're selling it all around the world, then yes, you may have just one sales revenue equation for that. Um, so it works well for uniformity. But if you sell different things, 
that are bought by different people at different times for significantly different amounts of money, you need to separate the, that and have different revenue models for each of those lines of revenue. Okay. Does that All right. answer the question? Okay. Any other questions? All right, so just to remind you that uh, we're gonna jump on Ohio Virtual Networking. Uh, uh, Steve just posted it again. Uh, grab the link and the password, it's very important. Uh, and uh, we will see you there in a couple of minutes. Jeff, thank you again very much for, um, for this great webinar. Um, this webinar will also be available um, uh, online uh, on YouTube as well for for people to view it later on. Uh, also, uh, are you willing to share? I, I know you said that it's not that useful, but are you willing to share the uh, PowerPoint presentation? Well, since most of it is pictures and no words, and you'd have to remember what I said, it's just a big giant presentation of pictures. What I'll do is I'll take the salient parts, the things you need, and that'll be in an outline. That'll be a simple document, much easier for you to follow. And so yeah. that's what I'll be happy to make available to you. That would be good. Um, there, someone's asking about the Eventbrite um, seminar workshop. Do you provide tools for entrepreneurs to move forward based on these concepts? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Civil is a, it's a, an Excel workbook. Um, and it has all of the things that you need built into it. All you have to do is answer questions and it does all the math for you. Um, and in that program, the lab sessions are just sitting with uh, the group working on uh, answering their assumptions and building their projections. So it comes with a lot more hand holding. That's great. All right, Jeff, thank you. We will see everybody on the other side. Uh, grab the code, grab the, um, um, the URL and we'll see you there. Thanks, Jeff, very much. We will be talking to you soon. My pleasure. Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you. All right. Talk soon.